you have your copy of God's Word, uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, as we continue our time in the Gospel according to Luke. This morning, as we do each and every Sunday, we gather in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We gather in His name, we gather under His headship, we acknowledge His power and authority over our lives, over our households, over this church. We do that together and we do that corporately. If there's one thing that we all have in common this morning, and I am sure uh, that we all have it in common because we live in this fallen creation, all of us have some sort of issue circumstance, difficulty, or hardship that we are facing. All of us have carried with us some sort of hurt, burden, anxiety. Something we face either in the present, something we've just faced, or something we know that we may face in the future. That can be a whole host of things. It can be emotionally, it can be mentally, it can be physically, or it can be spiritually. But what we have in common because we live in this fallen creation is that we are reminded each and every day that this creation is indeed fallen. And we gather together in the name of Jesus Christ for the purpose of seeking Jesus Christ because... If there were any other reason for which we gathered, if there were anything else that we looked to, if there was anything else that you expected from me this morning, then it would be futile and fleeting. We don't need self-help. We don't need someone to pat us on the back and just tell us it's okay. We don't need man's wisdom. We need Jesus. And we need more of Jesus. We need to recognize and acknowledge the power and authority of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We need to humble ourselves before Him, recognizing and acknowledging corporately together that we have nothing to offer, that we come to Christ with empty hands because our works and our own means are worthless to gain our justification from Him and to warrant His love toward us. We need not bring anything to Jesus. We just need Jesus. And that's why we've gathered this morning. That's what we see in this passage today. We see the authority and we see the power of Jesus in two particular circumstances. But we see the love, we see the mercy, we see the grace and the compassion of Jesus perfectly intertwined with sovereign authority over all things. Church, we are powerless people. We feel that each and every day, don't we? When we go to the gas pump, when we go to the grocery store, when we go to the doctor, when you wake up and you hurt in places you didn't before you went to sleep, we recognize, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, that we are utterly and completely powerless, which is exactly where Jesus wants us to be as we recognize His power, as we recognize His authority, as we recognize His might and what He is able and capable of doing. This morning we see this very thing in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. And I pray, I pray that the Lord through the Spirit of God reminds us of that very thing, of the power, authority, and compassion of Jesus. I have much to say this morning, and really if, if we were to go through my manuscript here, my introduction was really like that big and we were just going to read the scripture but I started talking so it is what it is but if you're able would you stand as we read Luke chapter 7 I'm going to read verses 1 through 17 
after he, Jesus, had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself. For I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And he drew near to the gate of the town, as he drew near, excuse me, to the gate of the town, behold, A man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, Arise. And the dead man sat up and began speaking, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Would you pray with me? God, we recognize this morning our unworthiness to even approach You in prayer. But God, we confess that even when we seem to potentially get it backwards, we confess because we know Your Word tells us this. Our worthiness is not found in and of ourselves, but in Christ who has taken our unrighteousness and given us His righteousness in this great exchange. And through Jesus, our Savior, we approach You asking that as we look to Your Word this morning, that You would, uh, through Your Spirit, do a mighty work. That we would see, become reacquainted and well acquainted with the power and authority of Jesus that we would be reminded that we would cherish and cling to His great mercy and compassion for His people. And that we would trust Him. And that our faith would be solid, that it would have depth, and that we would rightly acknowledge Jesus for who He is as we are His people And He is our Lord. We pray this in His name. Amen. You may be seated. So coming off of Luke's account of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which we considered over the last six weeks, this section brings together two stories in which Jesus responds to the needs of first a man and then a woman, each facing the loss of a loved one. One sick and dying, the centurion servant, and the other already dead. And once more, in these events, Luke is continuing to unravel the identity of Jesus, who Jesus is, what Jesus is doing, what his nature is, and who he is in the grand scheme of redemptive history. And so far, Jesus has proved himself to be a very surprising person. He left religious leaders marveling at what he was doing and what he was saying. His teaching left crowds astonished. And people were constantly left asking this question, who is this man? Who is this Jesus? 
Yet, as we will see from this text, we are to rightly recognize Jesus' sovereign authority and at the same time, His glorious compassion. As we rejoice in the hope that we, His people, have in Him. And not only must we, the people of God, recognize it, but we, also, we must also trust that He has, that He is, and that He will demonstrate His power, His authority, and His compassion in our lives. Because Jesus is infinitely powerful. And because Jesus is infinitely compassionate, Jesus can be trusted. We can trust Him with our lives and with everything that we have. And so the first thing I want to point your attention to from this passage this morning is the unrivaled power and authority of Jesus. We see this in verses 1 through 10. I'm not going to go back and read all of this word for word, but as you always do, keep your Bible right in front of you and you can look back as we walk through. So as the passage opens, we are introduced to a centurion in the Roman army. And a centurion is a man of status in the nation of Rome, being a commander of a hundred or more troops. Yet although the Jews have, and we know we've seen already this relationship between uh, the Jewish people and the Romans, although the Jews generally have a great disdain for the Romans, this particular Roman official had the love and respect from the Jews. This man was kind to the Jews. He had been very generous to the Jewish people, we are told. Obviously, a man of wealth because we are told that he spent his own money to build a synagogue for the Jewish people there in Capernaum. And not only that, not only did he, he use his means to help the Jewish people, but he also showed a remarkable amount of care for his servant. He is distraught in this moment over his servant and the illness that his servant is facing. So much so, he is so distraught over this that he was willing to go to whatever means necessary to see to it that his servant was restored to health. And so we're not told how the centurion had heard about Jesus. We're not told about what he understands about Jesus's identity as Messiah. What we see is that he simply needs help. And he believes, this centurion, this Roman official, he believes that Jesus has extraordinary power as much as needed in order to save his cherished servant. Maybe he had heard uh, stories about Jesus. Maybe he'd seen Jesus firsthand uh, in his teachings or his healings, but whatever knowledge he possessed, this centurion recognized an authority in Jesus that he himself did not possess. He recognized that Jesus could do something that no one else that he had appealed to before, which we can assume he has, could do. And as a man with authority in the realm of the military, he has a sense of what it means for Jesus to have authority in the spiritual realm. He's recognized Jesus as an authority by pointing out his own authority. And just as the centurion has soldiers ready to do his bidding, in the same way he believes Jesus has authority to accomplish whatever he wishes to do. And so these Jewish elders come to Jesus pleading on behalf of, of the centurion. Now, I think this is also something that we need to stop and recognize. This is a, another glimpse into the kindness of this Roman centurion, into his relationship with the Jews. It's a glimpse into his humble and kind heart as he recognized the, recognizes the social dynamics of his day. You see, according to Jewish custom, if a Jewish teacher were to enter the house of a Gentile, he would contract ritual impurity. And now a personal approach to Jesus would not itself be improper, but the centurion sends these Jewish intermediaries just to play it safe. And so these Jewish elders come to Jesus and they begin to plead on behalf of this Roman official. Well, how do they plead? Well, they appeal to his character. They appeal to what he has done. They appeal to his good works. They appeal to his merit. 
And what they are doing is saying, if anyone is worthy of you, Jesus, if anyone is worthy of your help, if anyone is worthy of your power, if anyone is worthy of your grace, if anyone is worthy of your mercy, it is this man. He is worthy because he has been kind to us. He has been kind to our people. He built a synagogue so that we can worship God. In our own terms, in our modern terms, we may say, he is good to his family. He is good to his neighbors. He is good to his friends. He gives money to the church. He helped fund a building project. He donated to a mission trip. He is fair in his business dealings. He's just overall a good person. This is what the Jewish elders were appealing to Jesus with. And in a sense, what they're doing here is attempting to persuade Jesus to work. They're attempting to persuade Jesus through the good works of this centurion to do something powerful. They're trying to persuade Him to come and intervene into this dire situation. Does this sound familiar to you? How often do we find ourselves in the place of the Jewish elders attempting to persuade Jesus to do something on our behalf? or on the behalf of others? How often do we ignore Jesus, cast aside our time with Jesus in personal prayer and Bible study, or even in the worship gathering, and yet when our backs are against the wall, we appeal to Him and try to warrant His help with our own goodness, with our own kindness, with our own works, and our own merits. This familiar prayer of God, I have done this for you. Surely you owe it to me. Surely you can do this for me. Or God, if anyone deserves your power to be put on display in their lives, it is this person. They deserve it because of all that they've done. Or more common, and we all know this one very well. If you will do this for me, if you will get me out of this, I promise I will do this, this, and this for you. This centurion's earthly power, his accolades, his authority, his good deeds will not coerce the Son of God to do a great work. Because the reality is this, we cannot take anything to Christ in hopes that it will persuade Him to work on our behalf. In the face of a holy God, our works, our merits, our money are as filthy rags. So this is what the Jewish elders are doing, but we see something quite different from the disposition of the centurion. We see a different posture in the centurion that is much different from these elders. Whereas the Jewish elders appealed to this man's accolades, whereas they appealed to his merits in order to gain or earn grace from Jesus, grace from God, the centurion comes to Jesus with empty hands. Or better yet, the centurion doesn't even come to Jesus because he doesn't think he is worthy enough to come to Jesus. He doesn't even count himself worthy to come to Jesus, but we're told that he sends friends to Jesus in order to communicate his own unworthiness. As Jesus is coming, he has this moment, and he sends his friends ahead, and he says, I am not worthy for you to come into my house. And in the face of this glorious man, Jesus Christ, who is doing these glorious things, this man who is from God, the centurion recognizes that he himself is unworthy to stand before the presence of Jesus. Even not knowing what we know about Jesus as the Son of God, the centurion still recognizes this authority that Jesus possesses. And I want you to imagine this, and we have to kind of get out of our culture to think through this, but imagine a Roman officer who was up here and everybody else is down here. Imagine this Roman officer telling a poor Jewish rabbi that he is unworthy to have him enter his house. Most would say, no, he's not worthy to come into my house. 
But the centurion says, I'm unworthy to have this man in my house. The centurion is displaying humility, something the Romans were not known for, especially before their Jewish subjects. But this man understands grace, which if you think about it is clear evidence of the Spirit's work in his life, clear evidence of the Spirit's work among Gentiles. He understood it in a way that very few people in Israel understood it, in a manner that very few people understand it, even in the church today. And not only did the centurion count himself unworthy to stand before Jesus, let alone enter his his house, he also believed that Jesus possessed unrivaled power and authority. He recognized his own authority, and he recognized that Jesus possessed an authority that even he did not possess. He believed Jesus' authority was so great, look at verse 7, so great that all he had to do, all you have to do, don't come into my house, I'm unworthy, just say the word. Just say a word and this servant will be healed. You see, true faith realizes that God can heal apart from rituals, apart from special ointments, apart from touch, or apart from monetary gifts to a faith healer you see on TV. The centurion recognized that all Jesus needed to say was a single word. Because that is unrivaled power and authority. His faith in Jesus was absolute and His faith in Jesus was unlimited. Even a single word from the Lord Jesus Christ spoken at a distance could heal His servant. For the Spirit of the Lord was present with Jesus to heal. And it is no doubt that Luke would long for his readers as well as for us in the church today to have such faith as this. Here is this powerful Roman officer. He was a powerful person in his day. Not only a man with military men subject to his commands, but also a man of means. Yet although he is a man of power and a a man of means, he recognizes that he is powerless in the face of great illness. And although we aren't given all the details in their entirety as to what is going on within him through the Spirit's work in his heart, the centurion is coming to grips with the reality of his powerlessness. Whereas the world, in accordance with world standards, would look at him and say, you are powerful, he is coming quickly to realize he is powerless. But before moving to this next story, let's take a moment to consider the contrast between the appeal of the Jewish elders and the appeal of the Roman centurion. The elders appealed to the worthiness of the centurion based upon his good character, based upon his merits, based upon what the world would say is good. I wonder if there are some things here this morning, some of those who are here this morning who are thinking like this. You see, we may not outright say it, but I wonder if this is what you may fall back on when you need God to do something in your life. Lord, I'm worthy for you to do this for me. For whatever reason. Do we think like this when trouble comes our way? How is this happening to me? How did I get this diagnosis? How did this terrible tragedy happen in my family? Why are my children rebelling against God? I did all of these things and I've done all of these things. Lord, do you see all that I have done for you? How could you bring trouble to me like this? I've been a good person. I've been in church, taught Sunday school. Or maybe we think that if we can just do enough, do more things, then I can be favorable with God and avoid hardship. Surely then He will look at me with a favorable light. Church, I think that our default is to think that our works make us worthy of God. They make us worthy of God to work in our lives. I know it's our default. I default to that more than I care to admit. And this is the question that is confronting all of us now. You see, the centurion didn't think that his works, his good deeds, his merits, his character made him worthy of Jesus. 
This man of great power in the Roman army recognized his powerlessness. He recognized his unworthiness in the face of Christ. He recognized that if Christ was going to work with work great power in this situation, it wasn't going to be based upon anything the centurion brought to Jesus. And so he came empty-handed. The power to heal does not rest in us. It rests fully in Christ. And He will not be bought off. His power, His grace, and His affection doesn't go to the highest bidder. Christ is unrivaled in power and authority, and we must posture ourselves like this centurion, coming to Jesus empty-handed, recognizing our own unworthiness in the presence of a holy and righteous God. And what we see here is that this man who is at a point where he recognizes his powerlessness. He sees that even where he is powerless, God is powerful. God is powerful. Where do you need to see the power of Christ manifested in your life today? In what area of your life have you come to the end of your rope In what area of your life have you recognized your utter powerlessness? When we come to this point, we often call it rock bottom. When we come to this point, a point of recognizing we are powerless in the face of our circumstances, this is where the Lord wants us to be. It humbles us. It causes us to look at ourselves and realize... We're powerless. And by God's grace and the work of the Holy Spirit, He causes us to look upward to Him. Do you long to see Jesus demonstrate His unrivaled power and authority in the life of your unbelieving spouse, the life of your children? Do you desire to see the unrivaled power and authority of Jesus manifested in your marriage, in your family? However you fill in the blank, go to the powerful and authoritative Jesus Christ, rightly recognizing that you have nothing to offer to Him. And as you do, receive His grace. Receive His mercy. Second observation. This next story, we see the compassionate heart of Jesus. Compassionate heart of Jesus. We see this in 11 through 17. As we consider the compassionate heart of Jesus, again, we also see the unrivaled power and authority of Jesus as well. I love these two stories together. I really do. We see this unrivaled power of Jesus. Not only does Jesus possess power over sickness, but He also possesses power over death. And yet in the midst of recognizing His great power, He's not some far-off deity that holds infinite power and just loves flexing His muscles on top of people's heads. He's not that. A lot of people imagine God as that. And what we see is the unending power of God and the beautiful grace, compassion, and mercy of Jesus. Perfectly brought together. What a great picture of our Savior. So we're told that Jesus goes to this town called Nain. And as He enters this small town, He is with His disciples and a great crowd that followed Him. And as they enter this town, they are immediately met by a funeral procession. Cemeteries in this time were located outside the towns. And burial normally took place within 24 hours of death. And it was an event for the whole community. And so as Jesus and His followers enter this town, there is truly a heartbreaking scene that they come up upon. There's a widow accompanying the dead body of her only son. This woman was in dire straits. Not only was she enduring the grief of loss, but in this culture, as a childless widow in this society, she would have no one to provide for her needs in her old age. All her hopes and all her security had died with her son. There were no government safety nets. There was no social security or welfare. She was dependent on the support of her family. And now she has no family. 
this is certainly a desperate and hopeless situation. And we can see from this that she would be on the outskirts of society, utterly powerless. And it's no surprise that upon seeing such sadness, Jesus has compassion on her. Luke says, when the Lord saw her, Now, this is the first time Luke calls Jesus Lord in this sense, and this translates the Old Testament title Adonai, meaning my sovereign one, or the one who rules over all things with all power and all authority. And the title that was reserved for God is now given to the Son of God, who is God incarnate, God in the flesh. And the first thing, and hear this, please hear this, and I know... Uh, Church, we have a family among us this morning who's lost a loved one. They're having a memorial service directly after our service today, and you guys know that. What a wonderful message this is for the people of God who are grieving. Some of you have been touched by death in the last couple of weeks. What a wonderful message of Jesus' compassion here. What a timely message. God's grace to us in this. The first thing Luke says here is that Jesus saw her. He saw her in her grief. He saw her in the depths of her sorrow. He saw her in her uncertainty. And He saw her in the midst of her mourning. In this moment when this woman's only son had died, when she was probably wondering, how am I going to survive? or if she even wanted to go on living. In the very depths of her despair, she did not escape the notice of the Son of God. Is this not comforting to us when we go to the house of mourning in grief? In the midst of our loss, in the midst of death, in the midst of sorrow and grief, we do not escape the Savior's eye. Jesus Christ sees us when we weep. He sees us when we suffer. And He sees us when we die just as he saw this sorrowful widow and mother. But here's the thing. He doesn't just look upon her and he doesn't just acknowledge her. He sees her and Jesus has compassion on her. It is no surprise that when Jesus looks upon her sadness, his heart goes out to her in compassion. And really, think about it like this. In the time of mourning and in the time of grief, is there anyone whose compassion we need more than the compassion of the Son of God? Who was like us in every respect except sin and who understands our feelings? Not only is Jesus unrivaled in power and authority, but Jesus is compassionate and sympathetic toward us. Book of Hebrews. And as he saw the heartbreak of this woman, certainly on the brink of despair, he could see her tears and he was not unfeeling. He felt her grief in his soul. It's easy for us, again, to think that Jesus is so far off, especially when we start considering His sovereignty and His control over all things, to think that He just sits at a distance as things happen. doesn't feel these things or doesn't know these things that we feel or isn't near to us or close to us and can't sympathize with us. But the book of Hebrews tells us a totally different story. Luke 7 tells us a different story. Consider his first words to this woman. Do not weep. Are you kidding me? He walks up to this woman who presumably they've never met in person. This man whom this woman has never seen. He walks up to this widow whose only son has just died and he tells her, do not weep. (laughs) 
I hope you've never gone to the house of mourning and told someone who just lost their spouse or anything of that nature, don't weep. Of course she's weeping. She's crushed. Her heart is broken. Her only son has died. But Jesus, listen, Jesus is not rebuking her for grieving at her son's funeral. There certainly was something tender and comforting in His voice, something that gave probably a hint of power over grief and over mourning in this moment. And not only does Jesus care, but Jesus can help even when faced with death. Why? Because Jesus has power and authority over death. You will not meet another person who does. Doctors may prolong your life, but they will not keep you from dying. Remember, His power and authority is unrivaled. Whereas every man will meet death and be unable to overcome, the Son of the living God, God in the flesh, has power over death, which means infinite power. Jesus approaches this beer. Now this is a kind of like really well-built and substantial stretcher or gurney that they would carry dead bodies on to the cemetery. Not a casket, it would be opened. You can imagine it. Some cultures, you may see something similar. Now, to give a little bit of context according to the Torah, for seven days, or excuse me, if you come into contact with a dead body, it would be considered unclean. And for seven days, you would have to go through the process of cleansing. And here is Jesus approaching a dead body. And as Jesus was approaching this body, and as He is reaching out toward this body, I am sure His followers were wondering, what in the world is, he go- is going on? And Luke tells us he reaches out and he touches this stretcher. And as he does this, those who were carrying this deceased man stopped, stood still, probably in bewilderment and disbelief as well. And then Jesus spoke. But Jesus didn't speak to the pallbearers, he didn't speak to the mother. Who did Jesus talk to? The dead man. Jesus spoke to the deceased man. Three times in the New Testament, we see Jesus raising people from the dead. Jairus' daughter in Luke 8 that we'll consider soon. Lazarus in John 11, and here the widow of Nain's son. When Jesus raised people from the dead, all that He needed was the same power He displayed just before this in healing the centurion servant. All it took for Jesus once more was a word. Now remember, this is the very one who spoke a word and everything was created. This is unrivaled power and authority. Jesus has power over sickness and Jesus has power over death. And I can assure you when Jesus calls, the one to whom Jesus calls will respond. This young man is called by Christ, and this young man is brought from death to life. You know, we read these stories, and we just read them like it happens every day. I've never seen it happen. Have you? This dead man sits up, and he doesn't just sit up and kind of, you know, like you wake up from a long nap. He wakes up, and he starts to talk. I'd fall out. Hear this, church. This is the one who said in John eleven twenty five 25, and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. On the last day, in the twinkling of an eye, he's going to say to all who are dead in Christ, Arise, and we will join him in the power and glory of his resurrection. It's our hope. And upon this great miracle and upon Jesus' demonstration of His power over death, the onlookers were filled with fear, not terror, but holy awe. They glorified God for what they had witnessed. And this was a normal response of the crowds when Jesus performed a miracle. They were terrified and yet they glorified God. Why? Well, because they knew they had just witnessed something that only God could do. So they glorified God and said, there is a great prophet who is risen among us. 
And this event would have drawn the onlookers' attention immediately to 1 Kings 17, 17 through 24, when Elijah raised a widow's son. Almost word for word, he presented the son to his mother. Of course, although this puts Jesus in the category with Elijah and Elisha, we know Jesus is much more than a prophet. In the incarnation, God has come to help His people in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus sees us in our heart just like He did the widow of Nain, and He has compassion on us. And He doesn't just feel sorry for us, He acts for us. He brings life out of death. He brings joy out of sorrow. Perplexing to worldly eyes. Our Lord... And Savior, Jesus Christ, has unrivaled power and authority because He is God in the flesh. And if we just think with logic for a moment, it logically makes sense, makes the most sense to follow Christ because He is the most powerful being at all, of all. Through Christ, all things were made, and there was nothing made that was not made through Him. In the beginning, there was Christ. Christ is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. Jesus has no rivals. Not even sin and death could defeat Him. But church, don't miss this. And I know I'm running on, but i got a few more things to say. He is not some far-off distant Lord who wields His heavy hand because He has power to do so. Much of our thoughts and opinions of God are constructed around our earthly experiences. And if we consider power and authority as it's displayed here on earth, there are many perversions of such power and authority. History tells us story after story of men and women given quote-unquote unrivaled power and authority who have abused it. Used it to oppress, used used it to abuse, used it to even kill. We see it in our own country. People doing and saying whatever needs be to gain power. So if we're used to seeing powerful people wield their authority imperfectly, using their power to oppress others, to push others down, and even to kill others, then sometimes that will be projected onto the sovereign of the universe. Yet this story and the whole of Scripture paints a totally different picture. Although we have a God who is creator, although we have a God who is sustainer of all, we have a God to which every knee will bow and every tongue confess. We have a God who holds unrivaled authority, but our great God rightly and justly executes His power and authority. Both, but not only His... Is, his, is He a sovereign, authoritative being? What we learn here is that He is filled with compassion and grace. And this is what makes Christ so amazing. He's not a dictator, but He's a loving, graceful, compassionate Savior. But the reality is this. There may be times when we don't think that. Why? Because life is hard. And as we walk through our lives, as we pray, as we seek the power of God for various situations in this life, there are times when we feel like God, as if God does not look upon us with compassion. There are times when we do not think God is all-powerful because of what is happening in us and around us. What about when the healing doesn't come? What about when death does come? What about when I'm praying and I'm calling out to God, I know you are powerful, I know you are good, and the walls still seem to be caving in on me. You pray for healing, but the healing does not come. What do we do then? I think it's in these situations where we really start to question the power, the authority, and the compassion 
of Jesus. But let us be careful, church, not to lose sight of the bigger picture. I submit to you this morning, whether God gives the healing or whether He does not, there is a great reason for hope in His authority and compassion. We have reason to rejoice. Just consider this story. In this story, these people eventually died. Jesus didn't heal them so that they could live physically forever on this earth at that time. Eventually, illness did come. Eventually, the widow's son did die. Eventually, the centurion servant did die. Or the widow's son had been die again. This was not a picture of final deliverance. It is a foretaste of deliverance. And it's a picture of the renewal that we will have as heaven and earth are rejoined together in perfect unity in Christ. We know that Christ has defeated sin and death once and for all by His death and resurrection. So yes, we have reason to rejoice. We have reason to rejoice because He has invited, invited us who were once outside into the promises of Christ by His authority and by His compassion. And so we have reason to rejoice. We rejoice when God brings the healing and we rejoice when God does not. Because we know that one day every tear will be wiped away, the pain will be no more, that death will be swallowed up in final victory. And so yes, church, this morning we rejoice. This passage gives us great hope. Our hope rests in the unrivaled power, authority, and compassion of Jesus. So hear this, and I'll close with this. When the prayers aren't answered, when the healing does not come, when the husband is not born again, when the child is not born again, when the marriage and family are not pieced back together as quickly as you want them to be, these circumstances do not change the truth about who Jesus is. Regardless of what is happening around us, He still possesses infinite power. And He still looks upon you, and He sees you, and He is near to you through the Spirit with His grace and compassion. And He is working things together to bring you into glory into final victory where they, there will be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more hurt, and no more tears. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, if you are His, He is for you, not against you. Which means, if He is these things that the Bible says He is, He can be trusted in all things and with all things. Amen.